So my wife's a photographer, okay? And I get the joy of going um, with her on photo shoots a lot. And this one was an easy one because we were in Pennsylvania visiting my family, getting to spend time actually with my sister-in-law, my one sister-in-law's family, because they had hired Madeline to do a whole family photo shoot. Yeah, it was really cool. They did it at um, the one parent's house. And so as her um, assistant you know, extraordinaire, I had to go run an errand real quickly. There was somebody inside that needed to be outside or something like that. And so I, um, how many, how many of y'all aren't the smoothest people ever? Because I, I, I thought I was, but I had my moments. And I had a moment. Because I was like bolting from the group in the backyard to go into the house. And I did not realize how many steps were on the way up to the actual, oh, yeah, my knee found one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My knee squarely, as I tripped on the one first step, found, I think, the second or the third step. And it was just right in there. And y'all, it smarted so bad. It hurt so bad. And it did not take long. Of course, of course they didn't like see it, they just heard it. It was that bad that it was like the kind of like, hey, you okay? What just happened? They're like peeking around the corner and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm fine. There's nothing to, um, nothing to see here. I'm okay. I'm trying to play it off, but I'm like limping. I can't do anything. Um, but because of that, it got bigger. Yeah? <laughs> like the knee got inflamed. It got swollen. Anybody ever have a, you know, hit, hit themselves and it gets swollen? Yeah. And then you know what happens next. That swollen knee could hit anything and everything that was a mile away. It was um, just anything and everything. It was jumping out at it, hitting it. I remember being, again, it was a f holiday, so we were this, this Christmas. We were hanging out in the family, and I'd be like at the dinner table, and I'd just go to like move, and all of a sudden, my knee would find the corner post of the ch table, and I'm like cussing at the dinner table. I'm just kidding. I wasn't, but it was, it was, it was painful. It hurt. It hurt really badly, and it seemed like it just wanted to jump out and hit everything. Um, because inflamed stuff is easier to be touched and impacted, yeah. right? Yeah. The bigger it is, the more likely it is to get bumped and bruised, and then set off even more and more. It already hurt before, and now that it's swollen, it gets even hurt more often and hurts even more. Y'all tracking with me? Yes. Now call me crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're really with me today, Colton. Thank you. Uh, uh, call me crazy, but I, I didn't like that. And I think it's important for where we're going with this message today. Because, I mean, I like, I like having feeling in my knee, yes, but I don't need that much feeling. Right. Yeah, that, that did not bless me. To have that much feeling in my knee that day did not bless me. It's because it's not normal or good or desirable to have it be inflamed with those side effects. Y'all yes. tracking? Yes. Likewise, we sometimes will find ourselves with increased sensitivity to offenses. Yeah. We just, whether we realize it or not, we're, offenses are coming right and left. We're increasingly sensitive to them. So we get bumped and we get bruised and we get set off more and more. And we get angered by things that, quite honestly, we should see are like unhealthy levels of, of things that are angering us and frustrating us. There's, there's more than should be. Something's inflamed, and so it's causing sensitivity. And I was working on this sermon a lot this week, and I was just like, I'm not going to be able to be creative. That's why I'm choosing like this. If I could, I actually wish I was sitting at one of our armchairs, and it felt more like a counseling session. Uh, not like you'd invited that, but I'm just saying I, I want it to feel a bit more, because here's what it ends up being. Here's what's inflamed that causes more sensitivity. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. Self-focus. And I knew, I was like, oh, yeah. And everyone at that point in the message is going to be like, oh, let me get the notes out. Let me take, this is going to be so good. This is so for me, and I need to hear this. No, immediately, our defenses go up. Because we're like, listen, I am not overly sensitive, and I'm definitely not overly sensitive because I'm focused on myself. <laughs> but the more you focus on yourself, the more anger can become an issue, and offense can become an issue with it. Yeah. Now, one of the easiest ways for us to think of this is like, if you are prideful, you're going to get angry more and offended more. If you think a lot of yourself, if you think you're pretty awesome, it makes sense that you would get angered more, right? Yeah. Like logically, y'all tracking with me? Yeah. But then also, if you are hypercritical of yourself, you will still also find yourself hypersensitized and overly angered because while you're critical of yourself, you're still focused on yourself. More on that later. But... But just think for a moment. I want you to actually think of it. Think of a person that you know or people that you know who are um, the least likely to get angry. They're just some of the easiest going people. They, um, they are not griping about being offended or angered all the time. Because you know there's those other people, right? That every time you hang out with them, they're like, let me tell you what offended me or angered me this week. And you're like, what was it this week? Yeah. You know, what was it today? What was it this hour? So not those people, but the people that are like, they just kind of are so joyful. They actually seem like they're enjoying life. 
It's just wild. You know, so these people, one of the things that I think they mostly have in common is that they're usually not as preoccupied with themselves. They're just not. And so again, I'm kind of ripping the Band-Aid off pretty early in this sermon. So here's the one thing I hope you get if you get nothing else. A lot more bothers me when I'm focused on me. A lot more bothers me when I'm focused on me. And that's not good because for you and for me to all know, there are no prizes that the Lord gives for being the person who is most offended today <laughs> or this week. Uh, he, God does not actually promise great rewards to those who are great at getting angry. Um, you know, the store in heaven is great for you who are great at getting angry. Instead, as we actually saw last week, and in case you don't know, uh, one of the improvements we're constantly making at Alive, by the way, are our videos, stuff like that. So if you miss a week, Kevin's getting even better at getting those up sooner. And so if you missed last week, it's up on the website. Go check it out. But we kind of saw last week that actually there are a lot of warnings in the scripture about getting angry too quickly. And, uh, and there's no question that a lot more bothers me when I'm focused on me. See, I think because of that, when we have a focus on ourselves, there end up being three things, and it's not in our slides, but unhealthy preoccupation, yes? Unhealthy sensitivity when I'm focused on myself, and lastly, unhealthy expectation. So just remember that, because we're going back to that. Unhealthy preoccupation, unhealthy sensitivity, and unhealthy uh, expectation. But here's the reality that we all need to know. I can't control others, which if you haven't figured that one out yet, you're welcome. Uh, but I can control myself, myself, and how I respond. So I want us to look at, uh, this is our main passage today, Romans 12, and we're going to look at it together, and it's a whole bunch of stuff here, but I want you to look at it from yourself, not what you wish somebody else would listen to, okay? This sermon is unfortunately for you today, yes? Yeah. All right, here's what Paul says, and it's like a whole bunch of things. Let love be genuine, so let it be real. Abhor what is evil, and hold on, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. See, we haven't left hope. It's, it's still with us. <laughs> Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, which is why giving is a good idea, by the way. I'm not trying. I'm just saying, like, it's literally, yeah, it's scripture. Um, bless those who persecute you. One of our favorite ones to do, by the way, right? Yeah. Bless and do not curse them. He had to make sure, just so we're clear. Um, rejoice with those who rejoice, and yet weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Uh, do not be haughty, kind of that whole pride thing there, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved. I love how Paul is like giving all these things. He's like, people who I love, okay? <laughs> Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, repay says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry... Go ahead and feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be, no, sorry, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I know, that, there's so much good stuff in there, right? Like it's like a grab bag of valuable solutions for interpersonal issues and anger stuff and all kinds of stuff, right? It's like a grab bag thing. And here's what I think though. You don't grab hold of any solutions if you don't think that you have a problem. So while there's a lot of great stuff there, if you're like, oh, I'm good, you're not going to grab any of the solutions. So in light of that whole idea of you don't grab solutions if you don't think you have a problem, let's talk about the wonderful hero of the Old Testament named Jonah. Because Jonah did not think he had a problem. And it was funny. I actually was like, I wonder, when did we last summer in the Minor Prophet series that we did, if you're an old school person here last year, um, it was July 10th that we did. So it was almost the exact same week that we did the week on Jonah. Um, so let's talk about Jonah uh, again. Because he's a golden story of getting really angry, really unhealthily. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, from the start, he's very focused on himself. What he did and did not want. He's like, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Yeah. God's like, I want you to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go. I don't want to prophesy to the, to the people and have them repent and follow God. God's like, I want you to do that. I don't want to. And then when he did do that, 
He didn't want God to show them mercy. God's like, I want to show them mercy. I don't want you to do that. We very much know what Jonah did and didn't want here. And uh, that's the song goes, well, you can't always get what you want. Anyway, uh, you're welcome. Mixtape series getting thrown in there. But, um, But Jonah did go to Nineveh, yes, and he preached possibly the world's worst sermon ever. It was, and yet in Jonah 3.10, it says, when God saw what they did, which was the people repented and turned from their sins, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and instead, he didn't do it. Because, y'all, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He's merciful. Same God. He's merciful. So they were awful people, full of sin. They repented, and God's like, so I'm not going to hurt you. Now, we 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 have a chapter break. But there's no chapter break in the original story. So chapter 4 starts, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And y'all, if you stay after for uh, practices of a fully alive life course, which is happening today, right after church, done by 2 o'clock, stay after. We'll make sure that you're fed. And uh, there's literally nothing else to do today. Like, come on now. Um, We'll talk about how word studies and all that can help you in your study of the Bible because it's really a fascinating thing. I just did what you're going to be able to see real easily today. You can do at home and looked up that, that whole part right there in the... In the original language, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And it's fascinating because there was a little footnote. It says, it could also be translated, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. (laughs) That was so good for me that I was like, this is worth my whole being here at church today. For me, that was good enough. Because basically, Jonah's looking at God's mercy for these people, and he's going, that's evil. (laughs) Jonah's got, y'all ready for this? He's got a righteous anger (laughs) about God's righteousness. And so it's exceedingly evil to Jonah, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger. Slow to what? Slow to anger. God gets angry, but he's slow to it. And abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord looked at the pouty Jonah and was like, do you do well to be angry? We're laughing because we're not realizing it's about us, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, and so, so the story continues, just so you know. The story continues, and I'm just going to tell you to you, that there's this plant. So Jonah goes up on the top of this hill, and he wants to watch and go, well, maybe God who's slow to anger will be quick this time and not merciful and not abounding in love. Maybe we'll burn him anyway. I really want him to burn him. So he gets a good, you know, like um, nosebleed seat to go ahead and watch the destruction of Nineveh. And this plant comes up and covers him, and he's like, this is awesome. And then the plant the next day withers and dies. And he's like, well, I should just die as well. Like, he, he wants to see a whole bunch of people die, yeah. and yet he's really upset that his plant died. Wants to see them die, really sad that this plant died. And God says to Jonah in verse 9, again, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry enough to die. So, note takers, here's our first point for today. Self-centeredness can make the ridiculous sound reasonable. Because Jonah's like, yes, I do well to be angry. And... Just because we feel validated in our anger doesn't mean we actually are. It is way too easy in our self-focus to think we see things right and fully as they actually are. Because Jonah did it. So Jonah got ticked. And he's thinking, rightfully so. Rightfully so I'm ticked. Makes me think of a woman that I saw the other day. Um, John and I were meeting. We have, a, again, a, a standing meeting every couple weeks. We get together. And as we're sitting there at the Starbucks on Route 17, this woman flies in her Jeep and goes, zips in, and is right in, like, three, I don't know how she did it, like, three parking spots that are all handicapped and then the walkway. And she jumps out with a huff, and we're kind of, like, looking. And then she kind of sees us looking at her, and she's like, these dang people in the drive through drive, yeah, drive through aren't giving me a chance to actually park here. Meanwhile, there are so many parking spots over here, ma'am. You have many options over here, but you don't have the one that's right in front of the front door that you wanted. She was like, these people are being ridiculous. Not letting me, not handicapped, by the way, just so we're clear. She's not handicapped. And, and, And in that moment, she was even making sure she let us know she is right in her anger. She is righteous in her anger. It's very fair. And, and from any kind of like, again, third party perspective, we're looking and going, sweetheart, you're crazy. <laughs> Love you, but mm-mm. But as we read, Romans 12, 16 says, never be wise in your own sight. 
That's why I'm warning us about this idea that some of us want to gravitate towards of like righteous anger. Well, there's righteous anger, right? Yeah, y'all, we are borrowing our righteousness from Jesus. We are, it would be really good for us to humbly recognize that while God gets righteously angry, he is also omniscient. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he knows everything. I, I don't. Mm. I, I sure think I can know a lot. I have been, again, I'm sure none of you have done this, but I've been angry at moments and then later found out that I was actually really misled mm. to understand things that probably would have made it so that I wouldn't be angry. Mm. Again, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. So we've got to be careful wanting to quickly ju jump into the judgment seat. And go, this is right, and this is wrong, and this is what should have happened, and this is what shouldn't have happened. Because an inflamed self-focus, remember that whole inflamed? An inflamed self-focus makes it easy to be sensitive to everything that doesn't serve our self-interest. Mm -hmm. But we're here to serve someone else's interest, and that changes things. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, Moreover, it's required of stewards, which he's calling us to be, we're called to be stewards, that they be found faithful. But with me... Paul says to this wonderful church in Corinth, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Okay, he's almost being a little bit rude. But in fact, he goes, I don't even judge myself because I'm not aware of anything against myself. But I am not therefore acquitted. I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pr pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart? Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Whether we judge ourselves harshly or really soft doesn't matter here in this, actually, as much as that we mess up if we think that we can judge accurately. Because it's too easy for us to make the ridiculous sound reasonable to us. That's why Paul writes this. He's going, I can't trust that my judging is that great. Because I really miss and don't see a lot of things that like, God does see. So I see us Lewis in the book, Mere Christianity, classic book, and he deals with pride really well in the book. He has this quote that I wanted to share with you. He says, pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even, and I love this part for us today right now, or even common sense. Mm -hmm. That self-focus, that pride eats up the opportunity for common sense. We start going, no, I'm justified. I'm right. This is what I'm seeing. This is right. And, and we end up being more and more like Jonah. God's like, are you, do you do right to be angry? Mm. We're like, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And everyone else is going, it's a plant. Yeah. So it eats away as you, it eats away, you probably does, as you stew and sulk and mull it over and gripe about it and scheme about it and post about it. Anger is energy, as we saw last week. So again, listen to last week. Anger is energy, but often it's wasted energy. Mm -hmm. And so it's good that we recognize that we, we can really seem we can, we can use way too much energy on things that aren't worthwhile. I saw a post the other day, and I'm, I'm kind of on the line of whether I should share this or whatnot, but I just, I'm going to be, I saw a post, somebody who had left alive years ago wrote, and they had unfriended me in the process, so it was only because of a tag that I was even able to see it. And in it, they passively, aggressively took a stab at all previous pastors they'd ever had in their care. And it was, it was hard for me, but I was also like, this is just sad. Because there's a scene, uh, ever seen the movie The Help? Yeah, if those of you have seen it, there's a movie, it's a story of um, back in the 50s, I think, 50s, um, and, and the, the, the African-American care that was had by these white people and how they were mistreated and all that kind of stuff. And there's this beautiful moment where Abilene, um, who's one of the, the help, she looks at Hilly, who's just an awful woman. And she's awful to her and kind of always doing these things. And she just goes, ain't you tired, Miss Hilly? Ain't you tired? And I think that's what I, I sometimes want to say to people who are constantly angry about so many things. Mm -hmm. Ain't you tired? Mm -hmm. You posting about my, my pastoral care years ago, and I know I did a good job. I know I did the best I could, at least. Ain't you tired? You, you, people constantly wanting to gripe to their friends. They get together, and all they do is gripe. Ain't you tired? People go online. All they do want to do on Twitter is just, ain't you tired? Holding on to hurt and offense because you know better is exhausting. Mm -hmm. So the second thing, though, is that the gospel gives us a critical decision regarding offense. The gospel, by the way, is this, that God loved you, you, yet with all this, again, I am sinful. I know that the person who's bashing me on social media, they don't know the half of it. I'm far worse than they imagine I am. But the good thing is that God loved me still. And, you know, knowing all the junk that I've done and will do, all the most shameful, guilt-inducing, can't believe I did this moments that I've done, that you've done, uh, in all of the spots of strength and in our wealth of weaknesses, he loves you. Mm -hmm. 
This is part of the gospel. Amen? Yeah. And words are cheap, so God telling you he loved you would be one thing, but in fact, he demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The ones who had done all manner of wrong against him, he gave the grace gift of the chance at forgiveness from the Father, that you could be forgiven with your heavenly Father. Imagine for a second that offer, okay? I know some of you, you've imagined it, you've accepted it, but just realize the gift that like all of your sins could be forgiven by the one who's most righteously able to look at you and go, how dare you? Yeah. And instead he goes, I love you. Amen. I welcome you in. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Imagine that, yeah? Yes. Makes me think then of the offer that he gave to, Jesus gave to the rich young ruler. Because he's offering that to the rich young ruler. And he's going, hey, here's the thing, thing for you. In the way of the relationship with you and God is your wealth. You've got a lot of it. So go ahead and leave all that you have, sell all you have, and follow me. I mean, because what's more valuable in that moment? A bunch of like gold and silver or eternal satisfaction and joy with the Father? And yet it says, and I'm going to paraphrase, it says that he walked away for he had great wealth and was very convinced that he should hold on to it. And I imagine similarly Jesus calling to us and saying, give up your offenses at others and follow me. But he walked away for he was very convinced that he had a right to hold on to them. Some of y'all might be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, is that a fair comparison? Because that's not what the scripture said. And I, I will say that I think it's a fair comparison using, the, using those stories because Jesus himself says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Yeah. The same measure. Right. But wait a second, Jonathan, I am justified in my offenses. <laughs> I need to hold on to some of them. They're right. Do you know what that person did to me? Like, listen, you listen to folks at a coffee shop. I like to go to coffee shops or Panera, wherever you like to do, wherever people are. Do you ever go out? Yeah, so wherever, wherever you go out to, I don't know, because I assume everyone would go to coffee shops, but wherever you go out to and you hear people just chatter, if you listen to people, you will always hear them talking about the offenses that they've received from other people. Yeah. Yeah. You'll hear people at coffee shops being like, oh, yeah, and then my ex, let me tell you what they did this time, and then they did this, the crazy thing. They're just nuts. They're a total moron. I can't believe, or, you know, my boss, what a total idiot they are, thinking that this would be a good idea to do, and I told them it wouldn't be a good idea. Anybody ever notice the voice they use for the other person, too? <laughs> I, I always want to have, like, I want to start telling stories where I'm like, and then I was like, <laughs> and the other person was like, oh, and they were, I want to tell it the opposite way. But anyway, you, you don't hear that at coffee shops. You, you hear people talking about the failings of others. You hardly ever will at coffee shops hear people going, and then I made this total bonehead move, and my boss was so right. Or my ex was so fair and equitable and I was just unreasonable. You don't hear people confessing that kind of stuff off in the coffee shops near as much as the other. Everyone else is an idiot driver out there. Total jerks, total yeah. morons. Yeah. How infrequently do we call ourselves out as idiot drivers or morons or selfish or not? Nah, because we're, we're the victim, yeah. never the perpetrator. <laughs> okay, our motivations are pure. It's all those other people out there, yeah? So we should be hesitant to judge the awfulness of others quickly because Paul wrote in Romans 2, he says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, the person who has seated themselves in that position, so self-focused to look at the world through your lens, you practice the very same things. Yeah. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you're going to somehow escape the judgment of God? I mean, Jesus is the one who said, let him without sin cast the first stone, right? Like, we're, we're not so innocent. People have lied to me, but I've lied to people sometimes. People have been unkind to me, but I've been unkind to people sometimes. People have hurt me, but I've hurt people sometimes. I get angry towards murderers, and then here comes Jesus, and he's telling me that if I ever hated someone, and I have, that I am the murderer's equal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The gospel invites us to a story yeah. of astounding grace and kindness that we did not deserve, yeah. Yeah. and invites us to focus on that yeah. and not ourselves. Yeah. It should make those of us who follow Jesus some of the most refreshingly unoffendable people there are in this world. Mm -hmm. But it's a choice that we have to make because Paul, as we read, again, and we're going to keep on grabbing from that grab bag. In Romans 12, we read, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Listen, there was another couple that used to go to a live back years ago when we were in the school. And when they left, they left well. They left for another church here locally. We sent them off with our blessing. It was just a, it was an okay move for them to do. And we're still friends with them. And it was actually a, ser- it was a, a message on offense years ago that I preached. And by the grace of God, God used that message to absolutely bring reconciliation and healing to this disastrously broken marriage that was littered with infidelity and all kinds of brokenness. Wow. But they just happened to come. That was their first Sunday. So people, and you never know when you invite people, wow. by the way, what God's going to do. That was the first Sunday they came. God used it in ma- many amazing ways. But the big thing is they had to choose, and they did, to not be overcome by evil. Because wow. there was plenty of it. Yeah. There was a lot of evil that had happened. Wow. But they chose, you know what, God's grace is apparently so good that we can remove the offenses and we can let evil not overcome, but overcome evil by good. Yeah. And what God's done in their marriage still to this day is nothing short of beautiful. Wow. Wow. And it's impossible just so we're clear, to do any of this without the gospel taking root in our lives. Amen. You can't, I don't know how you can get all this offense stuff in order without the gospel being at the root of it. Because yeah. it frees me from self-focus and self-righteousness. Mm-hmm. And it also gives me critical perspective shifts when it comes to hurt, fear, and frustration, like we talked about last week, and how I handle them. So, thirdly, the new focus creates new thresholds. Pulling our eyes off of the focus on me starts to change the way I process things. I process them differently. And they become different thresholds for different things. Yeah, making sense? For starters, I expect people to not do everything I'd like them to do. Come on, y'all. Okay, let me get you some scripture. Here we go. Colossians 3, Paul again is the author. He's writing and says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. By the way, can we just pause for a second? These are some like non-angry and some gracious kind of things. Do you see this? Not like anger is always bad, last week's message. But he's saying like, hey, let's be meek and patient and kind and humble. And then he says, bearing with one another. Yeah. Okay, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Those of you, when I said that earlier, see, it's in there, see? Um, But he says that you need to bear with one another. I don't have to ever bear with anyone who does everything I'd always want them to always do. You getting it? You don't have to bear with somebody who's doing exactly what you wanted them to do at every point. If we have to bear with one another, can we go back to that actually just so I can see it right there? Yeah, bearing with one another. If we have to bear with one another, the presumption, rightly so, is that people are going to be kind of hard to bear. Mm -hmm. So you need to be commanded to bear with one another. Even in church, because he's talking about a church. He's talking to a church. He's talking to a church that's full of families and friendships and co-workers and all kinds of stuff like that. Bearing with one another both means that something else is happening other than just everything going my way. So we're both doing a part. And on my part, I've got to own my part. Romans 12, 18, back to that. It said, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That's what it said earlier. And, And the idea is like, hey, listen, I'm responsible. And there need to be thresholds. Some stuff may need to be addressed, yes, but not everything. And probably not as much as I naturally would want, which is why there's two Proverbs I wanted to share with you that similarly say, the vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. Mm -hmm. You're wise if you actually let a few of them roll off your back. You're prudent. Mm -hmm. The wise person goes, oh, there's a new threshold for me because of the grace that I've been given, the gospel whole thing. There's a new threshold. My new focus that's not on me, uh, yeah, okay. Person who cut me off. It's not personal. They don't know me. If they knew me, they'd love me. You know, like, uh, um, I, just a new threshold. So I'm not going to let every insult hit me. And then Proverbs 19, 11, good sense makes one slow to anger. Yeah. And it's to your glory, friend, for you to overlook an offense. Amen. It is to your glory to go ahead and be like, listen, not, not going to. Now, here's the thing. I want to make sure we're clear. Just, I know we have to be careful about time, but... Um, that's not all the time. Sometimes it is loving, and I always tell, I do this, this verse comes up in my premarital counseling session with every couple, because I'm like, you're going to be offended in your marriage. Um, you will be. And it's to your glory to overlook an offense, but don't harbor. So you got to make sure that you're processing your feelings and your anger healthy. Because if you're like, oh, it's to my glory to overlook an offense, and you're just harboring it, promise you that is not going to help your relationships, any of them. Any, okay. But in this new covenant... That, that was the old covenant when Proverbs was written. In the new covenant, in the New Testament, we have um, the Holy Spirit helping us, empowering us to do this stuff. How awesome is that? When you think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all those, yeah. how they make you un- less offendable. Yeah. 
They really do go, hey, this is going to be easier for you. The Holy Spirit's going to dwell in you, and he's going to raise the thresholds. Yeah. And you're just not going to have to be offended as much, as yeah. by as much. Yeah. Jesus, look at him more and more, and as we look at Jesus, sorry, as we look at Jesus more and more, we can adjust our thresholds for what ticks us off yeah. more and more. Yeah. We have a better way of handling it. So I want to end by being really practical, because I, I always try to do that here in Alive, when it comes to how do we do this. So here's the last thing. What helps recalibrate my offenseometer? I made that up, by the way. <laughs> And uh, here's some practical solutions. Um, and uh, just because I'm, again, I like threes. Here's three things. We said that being self-focused, by the way, creates these three things uh, that we, we don't have a slide for. But unhealthy preoccupation, unhealthy sensitivity, and an unhealthy expectation. Yeah. The first one deals with our preoccupation issue from an inflamed self-focus. Yeah. And it's worship Jesus fervently. Yeah. Worship Jesus fervently. And I use the word fervently because of this verse we read earlier. Um, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. And that word fervent, again, word study. Um, we'll get into right after service today. Um, it's, the word is boil. It makes you think of anger. Because like a lot of the times in the scripture, it talks about boiling anger and all kind of stuff. And so Paul is going to borrow an anger word to talk about actually how you approach God. Be fervent in spirit. And so the idea is like, instead of maybe me getting so worked up, I want to get worked up about Jesus. I'm not, I'm not focused on me as much. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on him more. Yeah. And so I'm going to worship him to, to shift my focus. Some of y'all would do well to redirect their passion, which is not a bad thing that you have, a bit more towards the Lord who loves you than the person who loathes you in your family yeah. or the person who loaded all their responsibilities on you at work or the person who low-key is trying to push your buttons online. Mm. Look at the Lord who loves you instead. Mm. There's a beautiful self-forgetfulness that comes in worship. Not where you are nothing and God doesn't care about you, but you just don't think about yourself as much. Because mm-hmm. you're sitting there singing that song that we sang today and going, I'm actually joining with angels, just yeah. tons of angels, worshiping the one who matters the most. Yeah. Man, I just, I'm relieved by not being as important as I thought I was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, wow, I'm glad that there is so much greater going on than just me and in this situation that wants to tick me off. So that's the unhealthy preoccupation. A solution, real practical solution for unhealthy sensitivity, praying for and serving others. Mm. Now, y'all with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do not have to be a Christian to serve others. And in fact, if you're not a Christian and you serve others, it will probably help you in some ways to be less self-focused and to be less angry. But nothing compares to praying for and serving others out of an overflow of Jesus' love for you. Nothing beats that. Nothing quite helps this anger in that way. It's one of the healthiest ways, I think, of recalibrating your offenseometer to really go and pray for people. That's why in the passage we read uh, earlier, we're going to read a bunch of it again. I want you to see how much of it is focused on praying for and serving others. Paul wrote, let love be genuine. So don't fake it. Really love people. And abhor what is evil. Hold fast, though, to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Be constant in... Yeah. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on, um, on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Philippians, Paul even wrote, and he said, to not look to your own, only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Because I think the more that you're looking at things from how they affect others, the less you'll actually get offended and angry. It really is the idea of, like, if you really did these things, if you sought to, well, I, I feel like I'm not really getting honored in this, seek to outdo one another in showing honor. You, not in a prideful way, you try and be the most honorable person in this, in this situation. You try to be the person in this church who is the most honoring to everyone. You, you go ahead and you, when you're persecuted, here's what you're going to do. Don't curse him. Bless him. Pray for him. All these kinds of things. The idea is that when, you're, when your focus is off yourself, it gets that, you know, that, um, that sense of sensitivity away because you're just not as focused on yourself. You're praying for your enemies instead of gossiping, gossiping about them. 
You're not scheming for how you can get even. Instead, you're leaving it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is his. He'll take care of it. You're not letting the evil overcome you. You're getting beyond that. You're blessing them. And I'm not saying that this praying or serving people, by the way, is just in regards to people who are enemies or people who, who offended us. In fact, actually, when you find, friend, the calling on your life that God has for you to serve and bless other people, when you find the way that your life can leave an impact, even if it's something simple and isn't like ever on a stage, that you can bless and minister to people, it will absolutely help you to not get caught up in the weeds down here. Amen. Absolutely. Now, lastly, growing in gratitude. Again, we said there's an unhealthy preoccupation, unhealthy sensitivity, and an unhealthy expectation that come with an inflamed self-focus. Growing in gratitude helps with the expectation. Mm -hmm. St. Francis of Assisi said, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall enjoy everything. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a witty way of putting it. Because it's that idea of like, when you come with low, now don't, don't be, take that the wrong way. Oh, I expect people to be terrible. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we can come expecting a lot. And Paul wrote in Romans 12, he said, Abhor what is evil, but he didn't just end there. Hold fast to what is good. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. I'm convinced that if we were better at holding fast to what's good, we'd have better um, handles for dealing with what's not. If you want to bring down the swelling of your self-focus, just start listing out the things that you have that are absolutely worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't be too stingy there. Yeah. Be, be able to look and go, I actually, again, we started off the service today. I'm so glad that we have this space to be able to gather with these people and to yeah. worship this Savior. I'm glad that we have chairs. Yeah. Yes, maybe they're not like cushy chairs, but sorry, you know, the budget was where it was two years ago, um, you know. But um, I'm glad we have uh, air conditioning. I'm glad we have all these things. Maybe if this is an area where the Lord you feel like right now is challenging you, let's lean in a bit more, okay? Yeah. Maybe write the list down. Yeah. And, and then use it as a prayer prompt for you and the Lord. God, thank you for these things. I really want to grow in gratitude because I realize that I'm, a, I'm too given to anger and self-focus, so I want to just start instead looking and noticing all the good things I have. So, so start writing it down. Start praying about it. Extra step more, maybe start using that list to go ahead and turn into thank you cards to people that you send out. Not just thanking the Lord, but thanking others. Being a person who's very grateful and, and showing people that you're grateful and then make that into a habit because it may take some, some time for you to like relearn how to process things. And to relearn the way of looking at the world and going, you know what? Actually, God has been very good to me. Mm -hmm. And I have so much to be grateful for. Because just to remind us as we end here today, being frequently offended does not bless you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Being frequently offended does not bless you. Yeah. You know that in theory. That's why a number of you are going and willing to kind of like not. Nah, like, yeah, yeah, like that's true. But let's work it into practice. Imagine realizing in practice that being offended does not add to your life. And you started looking at it more and more of like, that's unwanted baggage that I don't want to carry. I, I don't have to carry that any longer than I have to. That's why Paul's whole thing about like, don't, letting the, don't let the sun go down on your anger is like, yeah, I want to get rid of that as quickly as I can. Process it, deal with it, do something with it, moving on. Mm -hmm. So you turn, because of that, to the gospel. And you get free from approval of others and chasing that and getting afraid if you don't have it or frustrated or whatever because God loves you. And you're quick to give grace to other people who do things that sometimes frustrate you or hurt you or make you afraid because you know you've been given grace. Yeah. And you're preoccupied with Jesus because of the gospel rather than yourself. And you are praying for and you're serving others rather than expecting them to serve you. And in gratitude, you've got so much to celebrate. You'll become incredibly difficult to offend simply because there's just so much less of you to defend. Your self-focus has gone back to a normal, healthy size. I wasn't sure if we were going to, and I think um, we'll just throw it up there real quickly. Um, there's a verse in 2 Timothy where Paul lists all these things about the end times and how awful people will be, and you can see it there if you want to. He goes on this list of just all these things, and if you look at it, like there's definitely a lot of angry kind of stuff, like lovers of self, arrogant, abusive, proud, all these kinds of things. Uh, ungrateful, by the way, is in there. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, all these things. But then, but look at this, swollen with conceit. I thought that was fascinating when I figured, I was like, oh, that's exactly what I was talking about. Swole, my knee was swollen. That's why I was getting hit and hurt all the time, way much more than it would have if it wasn't swollen. And when our conceit is swollen, all these other things go with it. For you and I to go through this life, which is going to have plenty of difficulty, plenty of hurts, 
fears and frustrations and have the right amount and do the right things with our anger, we need the gospel. And then we need to make sure that we continue to apply that gospel to our lives so that our self-focus diminishes, we're focused more on Jesus, and then we get to be those people that other people, when they sit in a sermon and are thinking about who comes to mind of who's just not easily angered, somebody who loves well, is grateful, loves the Lord, is not just a pushover, but is absolutely not given to their anger, they think of you.